Om Shanti. A greeting of peace to my sisters and my brothers. We're looking at how spirituality can help us in our day-to-day -day life. And now, I'd like to look at the subject of how to conquer anger. Everyone recognizes that it's wrong to have anger, or perhaps not everyone. Sometimes I've heard it felt that it's justified in certain situations, but yet we also see how anger causes so much sorrow, both within the self as well as in everyone else around us. And at some point in our life, perhaps we've been exposed to anger, or we ourselves have felt angry, and we've appreciated the fact that really it's something that's very negative that has to be transformed. And in the path of spirituality, definitely we consider anger to be a weakness that isn't one of the original qualities of the soul, and so it is possible to go beyond it. In the cases where people say that anger can be justified, let me just explain a little bit about that. If there's something which is wrong in a situation, if I simply get angry about it, I'm not able to think clearly enough to be able to deal with it and transform it in any way. However, if something is wrong and I can step back a little, and yes, I can be passionate about it, I can be filled with great power and motivation to try and change it, but if I look at the situation with peace and clarity, then I'm going to be able to transform it. Mahatma Gandhi's example is an interesting one. Yes, he could see that there was something very wrong within the whole system, and it was important that the system should be sorted out and transformed. But if he had simply got angry, the anger would have led to violence, and the aggression would definitely have brought about the transformation that did happen. Or even in recent times, if we look at President Mandela, and we see how in the situation he was in, when he came out of prison, if he had just been angry against the system of apartheid, I don't think he would have been able to bring about the bloodless revolution that did happen and the transformation that took place that's led to independence there now. And so it's possible to know that a situation is wrong and to be able to have strength and power and then to be able to work towards making that situation right again, to bring about justice and yet not do it with anger. In these two cases, one can see that, yes, there was something very wrong with the system, but if, it, if there had just been the force of anger, then we wouldn't have the results that were achieved in both cases. And so whatever situation I find myself in, anger, in fact, can never ever be justified. If I think about what's natural for the soul, then I know that what is natural is also healthy. If I look at it in terms of the physical body, then again I know that when the body is in a state of health and nature is moving in the way it should, I feel strong and comfortable, then everything within the system is in order. And yet, if the system goes out of order and there's something unnatural happening within the system, it's usually then a factor which is of ill health. And so I have to find out what it is and put it right. The same principle applies in terms of the soul. When the soul is in a state of good health, all the natural, original qualities of the soul emerge. If there's something which is unnatural, then that's an indication of ill health and there's going to be some type of pain or suffering. The original qualities of the soul are peace, purity, love, 
truth and joy. These are the intrinsic natural qualities of every human being. If I move away from peace and love and I get into a state of anger, it isn't natural. It's in fact extremely unhealthy and so it causes pain to me and pain to others around me also. Through the biofeedback experiments that have been happening in recent times, one can see the impact of mind on the body and also body on mind of course. But in this case let's look at what happens if the mind is peaceful. What's the impact on the body? When my mind is calm and steady and stable, then the body tends to stay in a state of harmony and order. And when the mind is in a state of upheaval, agitation, or even anger, then the impact of the body is a state of disorder, a state which is unnatural, a state which is unhealthy, and in fact, the upheaval of mind causes so much upheaval within the body that even if there's one minute of anger in the mind, the body tends to take at least 30 minutes before it tends to come back into a state of balance and harmony. If I have five minutes of anger, then it's not just a question of five times more in, in the impact in terms of the body, but in fact it leaves a very long imprint and it takes a long time for the body to settle down again. Think about the effect of anger in terms of the atmosphere also. I walk into a room and I can feel peaceful vibrations. I feel comfortable there. I walk into a room and I can feel that the vibrations are or of aggression, I de definitely don't feel comfortable there. I want to leave as soon as I can. Anger is impacting my mind. Anger is impacting my body. Anger is impacting the atmosphere around me. Anger is also definitely impacting the people around me. I think if there's been an episode of anger, other people don't forget it for at least six months. It creates such a deep impression in their minds and they'll say, stay away from her, she's an angry person. And so it's certainly not the way to be able to win friends and create an atmosphere of love, harmony and cooperation. I can see that anger causes great disturbance, is unnatural, unhealthy, and yet how can I deal with it? Well, first step is to actually acknowledge that it isn't right and I don't want it. But beyond that, what else do I need to do? When one looks at a pattern or a habit, one can see the cycle that's connected with patterns. The thought comes in the mind, it's expressed in action, it leaves an imprint within, and that imprint is the stimulus for the next thought. When this pattern is working in a positive direction, well that's wonderful. But so often we develop negative patterns, and at that point, in fact we can call them the addiction pattern. We tend to use the word addiction in the context of things happening out there. Um, drugs, chemicals, alcohol, cigarettes. We tend to use the word addiction in the context of substances. But that cycle of addiction, whether it's external substances or whether it's the inner negative traits within my own being, the pattern is the same. And so if today I give way to anger, I've created that imprint. Tomorrow, 
probably I'll give way to anger yet again and that imprint will have been underlined and strengthened the next time my fuse will be even shorter and it will take even less to aggravate me and cause that tendency of anger to surface. And so this is what we see in life. An angry person doesn't suddenly become calm, but day by day they get more and more angry. And so they alienate themselves from others further and further. Just as any substance addiction grows stronger in the same way every time I give way to anger that addiction within me becomes stronger and stronger how does one break this pattern or this addiction cycle well between the thought and the action there's actually a very important mechanism that human beings have and we've tended not to use this and so it's atrophied and we've forgotten that it's actually even there there's a filter in Hindi we call this buddhi and in English the closest we can get to the translation is intellectual conscience every time a thought comes it's actually supposed to pass through this filter and only then be allowed through into action. Well, this filter has either got clogged up or it's become so dirty that it's ineffective. It's been out of use for so long that it's no longer functional. Time for myself, time for reflection, time for silence enables me to start using this filter once more. If every few hours I give myself that opportunity to just reflect on the events that have occurred in the last little while, ideally even once every hour, let me be able to stop for even just a minute or two minutes and just reflect on whatever it is that's happened. And if I begin to do this, I'll be able to identify situations in which I didn't use that filter. And having identified that, I'll also be able to see that in fact it would have been much better for me and for others if I had used that filter. And so when there's that understanding and then the motivation that I don't want this addiction to cause sorrow either to myself or to others anymore. I decide I'm going to cleanse this filter of mine. I'm going to make it so powerful that even when thoughts arise, I'm going to make sure that that clarity and the power of will, willpower is so strong that I don't allow that thought to come through either in words or in actions. It's not the total answer, but at least it's one of the first steps. Even if the thought of anger comes into my mind, let me be able to have such a powerful break that I don't express it in words. I don't allow it to come through in any action. And the imprint that I'm carrying within my inner being, that sanskar, will gradually begin to loosen its grip on me. And of course the other factor is that if I've actually allowed thoughts to come through into words, the additional karma is that I've given suffering. And so at some point, probably sooner rather than later, it's going to come back to me again in return. Rather than suppressing, what I'm doing is dealing with it a step at a time. Sometimes people say that this is simply suppression, but no, I don't think so. I think it's important to take one step at a time and I'll be able to reach my destination 
calmly, coolly, patiently. Wonderful if I could deal with it instantly and eliminate that sanskar. But if I can't, and most likely, probably, I can't, at least to put a break to the karma that I'm creating, the pain that I'm causing, and to not allow anything through into action. Next step, I don't actually want even those thoughts to come. And I'm seeing a situation and I'm still finding that those thoughts are coming in my mind. And of course, when that happens, my face changes. Even though I'm not saying anything, it's visible in my eyes, it's visible through my body language, the vibrations I'm emitting are picked up by others. So obviously there's many repercussions that are happening even just simply through the mental state of violence or anger. But now let me approach it from a different direction. Having put a break to the external side, now let me deal with the inner side. And on the inner level, in fact, anger is coming as a secondary factor. Anger is not a primary condition. Anger is usually triggered because of a lack of something that's within the self. And then things happen and anger comes. For example, if there's an inner state of contentment, then things will happen and they might not be according to my choice. But I'll have the capacity to be able to flow with the events and move with the situation with lightness and not let myself be bothered about it. And yet there are other times when there's a feeling of discontent and frustration within the soul. And in those conditions, little things will cause irritability or little things will be exploded in such a way that they're really magnified out of all proportion. The other person involved in the situation will be taken aback and say, but what did I say? What did I do? It certainly didn't warrant such a reaction at all. To me, it's an indication that the state of the soul is in a state of emptiness. And when there's an emptiness, then to fill the vacuum, all sorts of things come in including negative things, because we're exposed to negativity all around us. And so the tendency is to pick up negativity. If I can ensure that I don't allow myself to either become empty or to feel this internal lack or have this vacuum build up inside, if I can keep myself full and fulfilled within, then that's a very effective way of actually being able to deal with anger on a long-term basis to the extent that I'm actually changing the imprint so that even the quality of thoughts that are arising are thoughts of peace, of purity, of love, without any aggression or violence. Then in that case, it's no longer a question of just simply disciplining my mind or controlling myself, but it's more than that. There's an actual deep transformation that has occurred. Meditation, my relationship with God, the experience of the self in yoga, in union with God, is the most effective way, perhaps even I would say the only way, to be able to actually fill the self. And if I can do this on a daily basis, connect my mind with the ocean of peace, the ocean of love, I have access to an inexhaustible supply, a treasure store that's never going to run dry, and I'm able to receive from the ocean all the qualities that I need. The influence of God's love and peace is also such that it awakens and emerges 
those qualities from within my own inner being. And so both things are at work. The influence from God, but also the filling of the soul from the source. And in that case, if I can fill myself with these positive attributes and emerge my own original, natural qualities, these then begin to work in my life. And I find that I don't react in situations. I find that I don't get angry or upset. And if I can maintain peace in situations in which others are upset or angry, it means I'll know exactly what needs to happen, what it is I need to do. I'll be able to influence the circumstances around me to also become peaceful and non-violent. If one person can be an example of peace, then that has a pacifying impact on everyone else around them. I know that in a situation in which I was faced with an angry mob, a mob that was trying to actually hurt another person who anyway was innocent, I know that the intervention of peace at that moment was able to calm a whole mob. It was a situation in which the mob was actually ready to lynch this person, but peace prevailed and even in that moment, all it took was a moment that was needed to restore peace and the atmosphere was transformed. And so, if I can be peaceful, I can make a positive contribution to things around me. Anger is not my original quality. Anger has come about because I forgot myself. When I remember myself and I restore the loving relationship with the Supreme, not only do I experience God's love, but I'm able to experience love within the self and I can be an instrument to share that love and peace with others around me. Anger becomes a thing of the past. Sometimes we've said that, that in order to be effective in the work that we do, we need to get angry, otherwise others won't listen to us. Anger is actually a loss of control. And when others see that I have lost control over myself, that's certainly no inducement to them to do what I would like them to do. Rather, they know that it's a sign of weakness. It isn't a sign of strength in any way whatsoever. If in the face of difficulties I get angry, then the situation actually gets into a state of disrepair that's difficult to put right later. But if under difficult circumstances, I remember my own original state of peace, then I can see the way out of the darkness and bring light into the situation. It's my right to return to a state of peace. It's my right to go beyond negativity. And I can do this if I link myself with the Supreme. Let's have a few minutes of meditation in which we emerge this experience. Sitting quietly, turning inwards, I come back to the awareness of the eternal identity of I, the being of light. In this awareness, I am peace. Peace feels comfortable. Peace feels natural. Peace 
is my original state. In this awareness of peace, I can feel the presence of the Supreme. From the ocean of peace, the ocean of love, waves of these qualities reach me. Not only do they reach me, they reach out into the universe and touch all other souls. God's love heals, strengthens, keeping this connection with the Supreme, my thoughts come back to the awareness of the things here, the things that I need to be involved with. But even as I return, I keep this awareness of my natural state of peace and love. Om Shanti.